Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to creating a just society and ending corporate domination. Our guest today is Elizabeth Swagger, National Organizing Director of Citizens Trade Campaign. So welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Thanks so much for having yeah, me, David. Yeah, yeah, and you've been here before, so it's uh, good to have you back. Always a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. So um, we want to talk about trade agreements, free trade agreements, and fair trade. Yeah, so talk a little bit about first about uh, why they call you know, these agreements like the North America Free Trade Agreement and, and the Central America Free Trade Agreement and the, the agreement we just, uh, well, I guess it's been a couple of years ago, did with South Korea. Why do they call them, uh, why do we call them tra uh, corporate trade agreements as opposed to what the proponents call them uh, as being uh, free trade agreements? Yeah, David, I think you really just uh, nailed the reason that we, um, you know, we fight these trade deals and the difference between free trade agreements with NAFTA, CAFTA, and other trade deals and fair trade, which is what we're, uh, what we're visioning for a future um, where trade policy uh, lifts all boats, as NAFTA was promising, and, and really um, promotes human rights worker rights and an environment uh, that's healthy and, and um, you know, sustainable for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, so unfortunately for the past 25 years, what we've seen in uh, international trade policy from the U.S. has been corporations sitting at the table and writing the rules for what they want to see from trade policy. And that's resulted in uh, lower wages for workers, not just here in the U.S., but also across borders. It's uh, resulted in higher drug prices, uh, while Big Pharma is one of the, the top industries lobbying for uh, corporate trade deals, the past one, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, they're doing this in order to uh, expand the life of drug patents so that they can make more profits and the result is making it harder for people to access to affordable, life-saving generic medications. Yeah, which, which, which means that people are dying. Exactly. People are sick and people are dying uh, at least earlier than they would otherwise. Absolutely. It is a matter of life and death uh, when it comes to uh, fairer and just trade policy. Uh, the opposite means that corporations benefit and it's at the expense of all of us. Um, you know, trade policies that we've seen in the past have given uh, huge power to corporations to be able to sue local governments over laws that we put in place to protect the planet, to protect public health, and um, you know, it's it's many of these cases corporations win. Um, you know, this, the odds are stacked against us when it comes to trade policy, uh, and and I think we're in a really interesting time right now because we have seen uh, so many people organizing, educating each other, educating the public, and uh, really um, mobilizing against the business as usual trade policy mm -hmm. that, uh, that we've seen for the past 25 years. And so I think we're in a place where, you know, people are rejecting the, um, you know, the corporate trade policy um, platform that, that we've seen and saying, you know, what is it that we want to see instead? Mm -hmm. And we have a, a very unique um, opportunity, I believe, to be able to turn things around and to be able to project that vision of what international trade policy should look like and what we should be getting our elected officials, our members of Congress, to be promoting instead of free trade agreements. Okay. All right, great. Yeah, so I, I really want to come back and dive into you know what this is, what this vision is, and, and the policies that we need to we need to be advocating for. But I, I wonder before we do that, if you could give us uh, an example of one of these suits that went before a private uh, uh, dispute, investor suit. 
investor state uh, settlement disputes. Oh, th thank you. <laughs> I know, it's, right, a, yeah. it's a mouthful, right? Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, right, yeah. You, usually I can get that out, but right, yeah. yeah. Can you give us just one example of a, of a, of a country that was sued, what, the, what a little bit of the details were? Sure. Let's first just start by uh, ditching ISDS and calling it investor rights, because that's what this is really about. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, free trade agreements giving unbelievable power to investors, to multinational corporations who um, are usually setting up shop in developing countries. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of the countries that uh, we've seen um, U.S. corporations moving into uh, using uh, NAFTA and CAFTA are, are countries that, you know, don't have, um, maybe don't have as strong of environmental protections to begin with or labor laws or public health, but they're there. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, They've tried to enforce those laws when, for example, Pacific Rim, a Canadian mining corporation, um, was doing business in El Salvador and polluting the drinking water, the river um, that people use in order to sustain life. Water is life, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, when the country of El Salvador um, realized that the river is being polluted and um, there was huge pr protest to move the government to take action when they did and refused to issue a permit until uh, the mining company uh, cleaned up the mess that they were made, making as they promised to do before starting operations. Um, Pacific Rim used uh, CAFTA, which they're not even a party to, but they have a subsidiary in the U.S so that they could work around it and, and use this trade deal. They used the trade deal to sue the government um, for trying to uh, enforce their environmental legislation. And so basically, with free trade agreements, it is taking power out of the hands of communities, out of the hands of local governments, and putting that power directly into the hands of corporations who are writing the rules of these trade agreements, of international trade policy mm -hmm. for their own benefit and at the detriment of people in the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so uh, th that's that's really an uh, excellent example. The, the other th the other part of that, well, you, you mentioned CAFTA, so I just want to be sure that people know that CAFTA is the Central America Free Trade Agreement that we signed with. Was it six six uh, six Central American nations? That's correct. Yes. Oh, right. Yeah, a and the Dominican Republic, a and. Um, uh, so. These these uh, uh, agreements are sold to us as being a benefit to us, lifting us up, giving us jobs, giving us employment, uh, but that doesn't always work out that way. That is generally how these trade deals have been sold to us, and you know I think uh, there's a lot of things that we can be doing to improve them, but. I mean, it, just looking at the history of it and the way that these trade deals are negotiated, there's going to have to be some substantial changes to the lack of transparency in these trade deals. Right now, we have corporations who are writing the rules of trade, um, and they're the ones that get to see the negotiations uh, and what's being negotiated on our behalf. Um, while the general public is left in the dark. And I think that is one of the biggest keys to really changing things. But if you look at the history of, um, you know, let's just focus on the environment and what kind of rules we've had uh, around environmental protections. In NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, there were absolutely no environmental protections within the language, within the text of NAFTA. Mm -hmm. Later, after much uh, protest from Democrats, there was a side agreement that passed, but it was completely unenforceable. Since then, um, I think it started with the Peru Free Trade Agreement, we have had some language around uh, environment and, and um, you know protecting uh, air quality and uh, you know, trying to stop deforestation. 
But that language has been incredibly weak to start with and completely unenforceable. Mm -hmm. And so even looking at just that first free trade agreement, within a, a matter of months after it was implemented uh, in Peru, the, uh, the um, government decided to uh, allow an, for an investor to clear cut part of the Amazon, the same size as all of Oregon. Wow. And this was met with peaceful protests from the, the people who lived in, in the forest, the, um, you know, the, the native uh, communities there. And that protest was met with violence. And so um, the Bagua massacre, uh, was a result. It was about 40 people who who were killed. It was actually on, on both sides, both both police and indigenous peoples. Um, but that is the result of not having strong, enforceable uh, environmental protections within international trade deals. It's a huge cost if we miss mess up on this, and we have been mm -hmm. uh, for the last uh, 25 years, and it's high time that we change that. Yeah, yeah, and this agreement that we had with Peru was supposed to be the, the uh, model for how, how trade agreements could be used to protect the environment, but yet it's f failed miserably. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, and we've seen it, the same language, almost carbon copy in every single free trade agreement since then. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, so a lot of, uh, a lot of organizations have uh, well, well let, let, let's go back to the Trans-Pacific Partnership for a minute. The Trans-Pacific Partnership was, of course, being negotiated by uh, President Obama, and um, that didn't work out very well for him, uh, and uh, in part because of things that, that pres or soon to be President Trump said on the campaign trail. Um, talk about, talk about uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership as a, an election issue. Absolutely, absolutely. I think I want to start with saying the reason why it was an it, w it was such an, a big issue during this election is because of years and years of educating the public, of mobilizing people, of getting the word out and sounding the alarm on how harmful these trade deals are to workers, not just here in the U.S. but across borders. Um, to the environment, to public health, to access to uh, affordable medicines, to hel healthy, uh, sustainable food production. Um, and it was organizations like Alliance for Democracy that were out there and letting people know what, uh, what an affront this is to all of the values that we hold dear. And because of that huge movement the TPP was dead well before um, anyone was sworn into office. Mm -hmm. So we had every single um, top candidate during the election publicly opposing this free trade agreement because of the massive opposition um, that we helped to create by shining a light on this very secretive free trade agreement. Um, you know, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was one of the most secretive trade deals ever negotiated. Uh, and like I said, you had big pharma, you had big ag, uh, you had, you know, Wall, Street, uh, Wall Street's best sitting at the table, getting a say in what they would like to see, while everyone else was shut out of the process. Mm -hmm. Um, so the Trans-Pacific Partnership was a huge, monumental people's victory. Um, and it didn't start even in the last four years. This is something that goes back decades uh, to people's resistance um, to NAFTA and every free trade agreement that has come since then. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's something um, that's really a turning point in uh, international trade policy and the way that we look at trade deals and what we expect. And now I think we're in a place where we can be expecting international trade policy to actually help people and to actually combat some of the most pressing issues of our time. 
And when I say that, I'm thinking of uh, climate change, you know, uh, looking at uh, global inequality, economic inequality, and being able to lift people out of poverty instead of what we've seen which is the race to the bottom in wages, in working conditions, in uh, environmental degradation. All of this can be uh, completely reversed if we can get the rules of international trade policy right. Okay. Yeah, it really seems like uh, the defeat of the TPP has really energized the discussion about what the, what the trade policy is that would benefit us, it, what it looks like, and uh, more, getting more specific o about it. it so, so there's a, a, just a lot more energy on this discussion, which in the past is the energy has been uh, in opposing agreements, and now we're talking about what do we want to see. Absolutely, absolutely. And I want to go back to uh, something that you said earlier about um, this election. I think. It's a little painful for me to do, but I have to give a little bit of credit <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> to President Trump in highlighting the harm that these international trade policies have done to workers and to communities um, within the U.S. And that is absolutely something that needs to be looked at, that needs to be taken seriously, and it hasn't been. I, I mean, I think you, you will find huge populations within the U.S. whose voices have been completely shut out, who have faced uh, immense suffering because of these trade policies that really only benefit corporations. Mm -hmm. President Trump has been using the word fair trade um, in advocating for what he would like to see, which I would describe, and I think many would describe as uh, economic um, nationalism. That's very different, really, than the kind of fair trade policy that we are pushing for and that we've been advocating for um, for, for years now. And for those of us uh, in the progressive fair trade movement, um, the language that President Trump has been using to scapegoat Mexican workers is completely contrary to the t kind of international uh, solidarity that, that we see within our movement. Um, trade policy uh, for us, fair trade policy, has never been about uh, U.S. workers versus Mexican workers mm -hmm. because we know that these trade deals have been incredibly harmful for workers in all countries. Uh, wages in Mexico have plummeted. Um, you know, it, ne it didn't lift boats in Mexico, and it, it uh, actually displaced huge amounts of, uh, of local farmers. Um, the markets were flooded with cheap, subsidized U.S. corn, mm -hmm. and it put many people uh, under, and farmers were forced to leave their lands, moving into cities working at Maquiladoras where they could hardly afford to feed their families. Um, so, you know, the, when you look at that, that's a, a lot of the root cause of forced migration. Um, many people that, uh, that come to the U.S. are not doing it by choice. They are economic refugees. Um, and, and this is <laughs> definitely part of the part that uh, I think President Trump has gotten completely wrong and has taken the absolute wrong approach when it comes um, to looking at the analysis mm -hmm. on international trade. And instead, um, you know, the focus is put on Mexico benefiting, and they absolutely oh, yeah. did not. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think uh, trade policy from here on out really needs to benefit people in all countries involved. Mm -hmm. Um, instead of the corporations, which really have been the, the big winners here. Yeah. So in, in this discussion and some of the stuff that I've read, there seem to be some rather specific uh, policy suggestions. Are, are you familiar with those? Can you, can you talk about those a little bit? Well, I think I would break it into um, three different areas, looking at 
how uh, trade, fair trade policy can benefit uh, workers, how it can benefit the environment, and how it can benefit public health. Um, so to start with, I would say that international uh, trade policy, um, current trade policy, has really been detrimental for worker rights. Part of that is because um, there hasn't been any language around allowing unionizing, allowing um, mm -hmm. some safety and, and protections for workers to be able to unionize without fear uh, f of retaliation, without fear uh, for their, their own lives and their families' lives. And the result of not having that language within international trade policies has been uh, cases like you look at the Colombia Free Trade Agreement where there's more uh, unionists assassinated every year in Colombia than anywhere else in the world. And so it allows multinational corporations to take advantage of this dire situation uh, for workers um, without, you know, they, they don't have to worry about uh, workers trying to fight for better conditions because um, you know, if a worker does, then they, you know, their life's at, mm -hmm. at, at stake there. Um, and so I think having strong language allowing uh, for workers to be able to unionize and have protections is a key to any uh, fair trade policy. I would also say um, that looking at wages, how can we be lifting wages and um, you know, ensuring that there's a living wage in international trade policy is another key. Um, and I think we can be looking at uh, campaigns that have been launched all over the US, the fight for 15, mm -hmm. raising the minimum wage. If we do that on uh, an international scale within um, trade policy, we could really change things around so that uh, you know it really is a race to the top rather than oh, a race mm -hmm. to the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would also look at uh, being able to have enforceable penalties when it comes to labor violations. And this is really key because we've been talking about uh, the investor rights and the ability for corporations to use existing cr trade deals to be able to um, sue governments uh, to be able to promote the, what they see as their right to make profits uh, and challenge laws. Now, if we had those same rights for, um, for labor and for environment, for example, uh, that could really shift the power uh, mm -hmm. dynamics so that workers, when there are grievances, are able to go to uh, a fair and unbiased court and be able to um, enforce these laws that uh, you know are on the books in many countries you mm -hmm. know, that we that we have trade deals with, uh, and be able to have some serious protections. Um, and you know the, that's that has been uh, hugely missing from trade policies. Mm -hmm. Um, the few times that cases have been brought up, which is a very rare thing, it's very difficult to be able to bring these uh, cases up. There isn't the resources in place, and there really isn't the infrastructure uh, on the international level to be able to handle these cases. Um, you know, in the rare cases that uh, that a grievance is brought up, um, and I think. You know, only in one case in Honduras has that been successful. The result has been uh, a, a basically just a letter saying that this is wrong. Oh. And <laughs> that's very, <laughs> very different than what we're seeing with the corporations yeah, yeah. that are oh, bringing right. up cases. Yeah. So let me ask you. We've we've got just three minutes. So uh, let let me ask you if we're if we're trying to get uh, a different model of trade in, enacted, then who needs to be at the table? That is a great question. I think that's really the key to being able to create policy that benefits uh, workers, the environment, uh, farmers, um, and, and, it, and public health. And it's, it, we're going to need civil society at the table. So we need to have the voices of unions. We need to have the voices of uh, community members. We need to have, um, you know, uh, officials that uh, work to protect public health at the table. 
Um, you know, I, I think that uh, we need to be drawing for, from uh, the UN uh, core conventions and be able to, um, you know, insert that language within our international trade policy. And it's going to be civil society agents that are going to bring that voice and be able to lead uh, a new policy, a new day in international trade. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that's going to be the key. That's the key with union organizing is where you have people come to the table as equals. And that's what we need to really shift the paradigm with international trade policy. Okay, great. And um, what would, what would well, we only got uh, another uh, minute and a, and a half. So w what would you leave out of trade agreements? Well, I think we've discussed a number of them, but one would definitely be ISDS, the investor right uh, provisions. That's something that uh, has been hugely detrimental, especially to uh, developing countries. Um, you know, I, I think I would also <laughs> leave out uh, the language around intellectual property rights that allow um, big pharma to be able to expand the life of drug patents um, you know, and I, I think that uh, there's a lot of things that we need to bring into these trade policies as well. Uh, as I discussed, um, you know, having strong language, enforceable language around uh, labor rights and, mm -hmm. and worker rights, as well as strong enforceable language to combat climate change. Mm -hmm. um, being able to incorporate, um, you know, the Paris Agreement, I, I think, could really make a huge difference in giving leverage to, to countries to be able to address, you know, one of the biggest issues that's facing everyone on this planet. So those are a few areas that I think we can be, uh, that are concrete ways that we can be changing uh -huh. our international trade policy, and now is the time to do it. Now is the time to do it. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thank, Thank you for you, being David. here. Great. Good. My pleasure. Great. So thank you, Elizabeth, for being here. Uh, Elizabeth is National or or Organizing Director of the Citizens Trade Campaign. If you want to read some of the reports issued since the beginning of the Trump administration on how we can achieve fair trade, visit the Alliance for Democracy Oregon webpage on Creating Fair Trade. Just search for Creating Fair Trade and look for that link to the Alliance for Democracy Oregon website. You will find there are papers and reports including a discussion paper, a new climate-friendly approach to trade by the Sierra Club, a report by Jared Bernstein and Lori Wallach of Public Citizen, and a letter addressed to the president by the Citizens Trade Campaign, and there's more there too. I hope you've enjoyed this program. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.